He's done a lot of the work. This is really a lot of Jonathan's work. Um, he's one of our, our GIS analysts. And then let you guys introduce yourselves. I'm Chris Barnett. Um, I'm a geospatial analyst at Tufts. I do a lot of uh, development work uh, on the open geo form. And I'm Carolyn Tonish, the GIS specialist at Tufts. Working a lot with the new data lab, our other services. Go on. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do today is um, talk a little bit about um, the Open Geoportal Dashboard Analytics, as Dave mentioned, um, that we've been working on. Um, before that, I wanted to see how many people have, are familiar with Open Geoportal, what it is. Some people might not be. So what the Open Geoportal sort of federation is, um, this is the only slide I will read, I promise, is a uh, collaborative developed open source uh, federated both social and technical framework uh, really designed looking around rapid discovery, documentation, preview retrieval of curated uh, geospatial data from multiple repositories. So we like to bring silo data in from all these silos into one environment and to do stuff with it. Um, real quick, I just want to show you the architecture. And Jeff, you're just filming the screen, right? Right. Perfect. So um, I like to stay a little bit. Um, so what you'll see here on this sort of architecture is you have on the back end here all of these different repositories of spatial data. And there are much many more than these. So these are big repositories, hundreds of thousands of data sets of repositories of geospatial data. There are also repositories of metadata. The way that uh, Open Geoportal typically works is through this harvester right here, Open Geoportal Harvester. This is, these are all separate modules that we've designed. Uh, the harvester will harvest all the metadata from these repositories and then ingest that into a separate solar uh, cloud instance. Solar is, as they'll know, it's a, uh, an open source enterprise search environment. A really powerful index tool. So we harvest all this uh, metadata from all these repositories, push it up there, and then that's what we search with our application when the user comes to the interface. They search the solar index and they get returns. When they want to actually download data or view data sets, these are spatial data sets such as roads and rivers and all this sort of stuff, buildings. Then that comes to the web services that we pull from uh, those repositories. So the data stays where it's at basically, but we harvest the metadata uh, into this big solar cloud. And it's important because the solar cloud is what we're going to talk about today, what we're using around this. Um, just a real quick, so this is the Open Geo Portal front end. I'll show you. So this is the actual Open Geo Portal. <laughs> Uh, our discovery interface, if you will. And so, click on this guy. And drag this over a little bit. Okay. So basically, as you're going to search, I'm just running a global search right now. Um, and I'll include restricted data sets. So there's a little bit of delays here. Um, there's a, just under 60,000 data sets um, that are available right now. I'm not going to go through and show you. Most of you know how the application works. I'm not going to go through and show that. But I'll show you in the advanced search here. These are the repositories we're pulling from. So there's things like Tufts, there's Harvard, right? MIT, Columbia, Stanford. We're pulling from all the repositories. Princeton, University of Minnesota, University of Wisconsin, Madison. These are all partners. The UN, uh, FAO, they've got about 9,000 data sets. Uh, our state GIS office, New York State GIS office. U.S. Geological Survey, so we have every um, topo map ever, ever made is in here. Uh, the PASDA, that's the Pennsylvania Clearinghouse, it's all their state clearinghouse and data, as well as Connecticut and others. So, um, if people set up the back end architecture, right, it's pretty easy to harvest their services and bring all the silo data out. But the real topic here is a sort of dashboard um, idea. So, the way this started is We've been kind of tooling around the idea for a while that we wanted to be able to, how do we visualize um, massive repositories of data? Not search and find one layer, but how do we really visualize and get an understanding of the holdings and what's going on in, and everyone else's holdings? So how do we really get a handle on what coverage we have of data, what type of data, what does Harvard have versus Tufts have, all that sort of stuff. And we were at the um, we were in Switzerland in March at the um, the Geo Network 3 Summit. Um, and that's where all the national mapping agencies from Europe were there uh, to participate in this thing called Inspire, which is the European Union's attempt to do something very similar. It's very formal. 
And we were working with the EU folks on this, and they had started with a lot of dashboard analytics tools, and we really liked them. So we decided to kind of partner with them and kind of move forward in that same direction. No further to say, Chris, and then you're done. Okay. So what I'm going to show is just a, a couple of examples of dashboards. One on, on um, open geoportal dashboards, looking at massive collections. Also dashboards, analytic dashboards we've set up that actually track usage, how a site is being used, as well as an example of dashboards for teaching and research. This gets away from data a little bit, but it actually looks at institutional research data uh, or research work. And then finally, the metadata inspector uh, that some of you might be interested in. So real quick, so this is a dashboard we've designed uh, for the Open Geo Portal data holdings. So these are for all those repositories I mentioned, and we're actually looking at their data holdings. So this is a dashboard that focuses on, on all of their data. And you'll see we have spatial coverage here. This is a special Tufts one, it's Tufts only, because we have a specific interest in Tufts. Harvard can easily set one up for Harvard, et cetera, or MIT. This is all of the um, all of the holdings in the spatial coverage here. And we have lots of other information here. Um, you'll see on public, private versus data, all that sort of stuff. What I'm going to do is you notice that Princeton is huge. Princeton has about 28,000 data sets in their repository. Um, and you'll see, here's, Princeton, here's Harvard as well. Harvard has quite a bit. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of Princeton right now. I'm not sure because in a way they're kind of skewing the data. We're really looking at Princeton almost because they have so much data. So I'm going to do a thing real quick to kind of just remove them. So all of this is interactive. All right, it takes a second here. There's a lot of data we're querying. Now, this is a little better. So now, so this is basically most of the OGP holdings from all the different repositories. And you'll see Columbia has a fair amount of restricted data. Harvard has a ton of data that's publicly available, right? There's about 7,500 data sets. Um, Harvard also has restricted data. Like many of us have both restricted and unrestricted data. Restricted data is licensed data from a vendor that typically is only usable, let's say, for Harvard affiliates. Because um, we, we all have that sort of stuff, many of us. But we can look at things like data type. So one of the things is like, whether it's points, lines, um, or polygons, or scan maps, right, which is 1,800-something scan maps in here right now. They're also looking at uh, metrics on public versus uh, restricted data. So about 75% of this public data, this is all of the repositories together. And then put some things together like we do some basic text clouds uh, on place keywords to get a sense of, of what's going on, where the coverage is. You'll see the coverage here for everything you'll see. Not surprising, the United States has heavy coverage up here with a specific heavy duty emphasis on the Northeast. Also, pretty good emphasis here in the Midwest. And we'll talk about that from the University of Minnesota and Wisconsin repositories. Um, and then, as I scroll down, we can also see uh, in the holdings the top publishers, right? The top originators, um, the top thematic keywords that we're pulling through. So this is really getting a sense of what type of data it is, not just spatial coverage, um, but is it data related to transportation networks, things like that. Not surprising, boundary data sets are pretty prominent. Census data is very prominent. I shouldn't really surprise any of us that work with this sort of data. And then also sort of uh, doing sort of basic text cloud analysis and looking at the theme keywords as well. Ways of kind of visualizing and getting into these holdings. So one thing we can do, if we're interested, this is all interactive, let's say we're often interested in publicly available data sets. So here now we're gonna do all the same coverage. Notice the map, because you're gonna see a lot of different changes here. Did I get it? Sometimes it's a little, there we go. All right. So update a little bit. Still a little slow. So now this is publicly available data. You'll see Harvard's leading the lay here with publicly available data. See, the map transform of data was pretty heavy Eurocentric before. Now with a lot of publicly available data sets, you're seeing we get much greater coverage in Africa, uh, part of Southeast Asia, still a ton of stuff in the Northeast and all that, which is great because a lot of that data we can give out to the public. Then if you look at Harvard's hold, if we look at these holdings, you're gonna see this, there's a difference between the different types of data sets uh, that are coming in, right? And the theme keywords, et cetera. Once again, census data, boundaries, that sort of stuff are, are tops in the list. Now what I also can do is take a look if I want to Harvard data. So we can start drilling down. So now this is publicly available. 
harbor data. And notice the spatial coverage here is going to change again. So this is the spatial coverage. It takes a second to update the maps. But, yeah. um, so you'll see there's a fair amount of coverage here in Europe. Harvard's, a lot of Harvard's collection is fairly Eurocentric compared to some other ones. Like Tufts, you'll see, we're heavy, heavy into the developing world, particularly in Africa, where Tufts does a lot of work, and a lot of work in South Asia as well. You can also see that the scan maps have dramatically increased here, right? Harvard has a huge collection of scan maps, along with some other schools, Princeton, Stanford do as well. Tufts, we don't have so many scan maps. But in, anyway, you get a sense, you get the same metrics. Uh, you'll see keywords in Massachusetts, right? Harvard has probably the first institution that started archiving mass GIS data back into these days, what was it, like 97? Started collecting that stuff, I think, before even I was at Harvard. Um, anyway, so this is just a good, trying to give a sense of the overview of these different tools where we can uh, Kind of examine the actual collections themselves. What are they composed of? What's the spatial coverage? What sort of thematic coverage? Uh, that sort of thing. You want to add water onto that? Maybe is that the one you're thinking? Yeah. yeah. So now what we we'll do is let's see what Harvard's. I'll do one last thing. Let's look at. Um, we'll qualify it with a theme keyword, and we'll do it with water. So now this is publicly available data held at Harvard that's related to water. And notice the map change as well. So the map changed dramatically here now. Starting to see much more coverage in Africa, right? Eastern China, Northeast. So it's a very different set of coverages. And you can see as well, there's going to be a lot of scan maps. Um, it's kind of the way the scan maps are cataloged. Many maps have water on them uh, as, a, as a feature, so it often gets into the catalog record. Things like that. But anyway, so, so Harvard has a total of 2,770 publicly available data sets related to water. And here's what the coverage is. So these are the ways of looking at collections and metrics on collections. I'll add one thing here too. There's also timeline ability. So here you can also set up timelines. So here we have a timeline right now. We're looking at uh, November 1915 to June 2015. This is content date. These are the dates of the data sets themselves or of the maps that they represent. And you can see there's quite a bit of uh, coverage here in the early 20th century. And then you'll see some big spikes here. So there's a big spike at 90, a big spike at 2000, and a big spike at 2010. So what are those spikes? Censuses, censuses right? Those are US censuses, not surprising. Anyway, once again, this you'll get a sense of just the timeline stuff. And this is all interactive, so if I wanted to, I could, uh, yeah, do I just, I just grab your knowledge? Yeah, we do. Oh, sorry. So it's all interactive too. So I wanted to just look at this sort of data. And then I can actually see. In fact, you can ultimately drill down to the data sets to see the actual data sets if you want to. So this is kind of analytics on collections of massive, massive collections of geospatial data. But what I think a lot of us are really interested in, in is how people are using our sites. So what this is, is this is another dashboard we've set up. And so this is um, how this is how people are using the, our Tufts instance of Open Geoportal. So this is our Tufts interface we're looking at here, which is, what? This is going to change, don't worry about that. So this is basically geodata at Tufts that we're looking at here. Hit, just hitting our interface. Now they're getting data from over repositories from all over the place, but this is how people are using our interface. So this isn't Harvard's interface, we're not looking at Minnesota's interface, anything like that. So once again, we have a timeline here. And here we're showing basically uh, February 2015 to July 2015. And we can see some classic spikes in this data right off the bat. We can see usage early on in the semester where students' projects likely hit. And we can see at the end of the semester when we start to get a lot more hits going on at the university. And I'll flush this out in a second and show you. Um, we also have some, some basic analytics on how well you can see on things like word searches, uh, spatially where people are searching. So this isn't this isn't the spatial holdings of the data. This is where people are searching for data, which is very interesting. And down below, we actually see where they're coming from. So this is we a couple different visualizations on uh, where people are or where people are coming from as they search from data, search for data. And you'll see it's pretty global coverage you got through Asia, Europe, right, etc., the United States. Not surprising. Massachusetts, you have a lot of people in Massachusetts searching for data. 
for all over the world, right? I'm gonna make a quick change here and go to just the OGP2 instance. We'll talk about how we're doing all this through <coughs> and that's, that's what I was gonna ask, because maybe you already said this, but was the first an analysis coming from your solar data, this is coming from like special instrumentation or yeah, yeah the catalogs first, or the first one is, is is hitting our solar instance. This one we'll get into the details of that bit. It's um it's actually using logs. So we're parsing out logs, uh, solar and patch logs. Did I get that? Okay, here we go. All right. This is a better representation of the timelines. A couple different ways of visualizing timelines of hits on the site, things like that. So here, one of the things we see is we see spatial coverage of where people are searching for data. And we're gonna flush out the maps. Well, it's kind of our big plan is to improve the mapping side of things to see where people are searching for data. Not surprising, heavily in New England, Northern Latin America, uh, Europe, etc. We also see the top keywords. There was one person that was like really obsessed about national parks on here, I think that's, so it's skewed it a little bit. But people are searching for buildings. I don't think that surprises any of us to do GIS work, building footprints like Jeff we were just talking about this morning, uh, really valuable data set that can be hard to get, right? Also people searching for roads, uh, more national parks sort of thing. Um, what we can also see is uh, the top layers that are being downloaded. So this is from Tufts site, the top layers that are being downloaded. Uh, Ecuador land use was a really popular one apparently. Um, once again, you'll see New York City building footprints right here, or heavily, heavily downloaded. Uh, that doesn't shock many of us either. Tons of people study New York, especially at Tufts and other places, and want building footprints. We can also see where the data, the data is coming from uh, that's being downloaded. GIS portals, Tufts. These two are Harvard. So this is data that's being downloaded is being data from being downloaded from Harvard through our interface. And just like Harvard will have a lot of data that's being downloaded from Tufts through Harvard's interface, et cetera. But it's great to get the metrics on this. And I know Randy, we wanted to, we wanted this for a long time. We talked about this, and all the different schools and organizations want this. Stanford wants to see how people are using their data, et cetera. And then this is MIT right here. We also can see the, the top metadata that's being viewed. So people are just, they may not be previewing the data set, but they're previewing the metadata, they're viewing the metadata. Tons of people viewing uh, Haiti, uh, this political boundaries. We do a lot of work at Haiti at Tufts, so that's, that doesn't shock us at all. Planning distance for Boston, planning districts. So a really good sense of what people are searching for, uh, and not necessarily what we have, but what they're searching for. And the next step for us is how do we really combine that? How do we say, to help us build collections for what people are searching for and using and that sort of thing. Um, and once again, this is all interactive. So if I wanted to, I could, let's say, take a look at roads. And let's see, for people who are searching for roads, where are they searching spatially? I don't know that I would have guessed this. Right here, the United States doesn't surprise us, or New England, but lots in Northern Latin America, Southern Europe, places like that. There's heavy concentrations of people searching for roads. And this is only over a six month time period, five month time period work. So what country is that in Africa that's actually using <laughs> Open Geo Portal? Yeah, we're yeah, or someone's searching for that. Yeah, we're winning the same thing, I'm not sure. It's like, it's one of the islands. Um, but it could also be the magical zero zero, right, in the world. No, no, no this one. No, this one, <laughs> okay. Zero zero is probably the most commonly mapped place in the world. Because if we have errors or anything like that, zero zero is where often a lot of things go. Um, so it's probably a whole fiction around zero zero. <laughs> Lat that's the latitude longitude zero zero. Um, so anyway, this is I'm showing. This is also about usage because we're really interested in collections and also how people are using uh, the collections or what they're searching for, I should say, and how they're using the site. One thing I want to touch on real quick, and then I'll get to the metadata inspector and I'll wrap it up, is. So something we're really interested in at Tufts is we have, many of you know, we have a big giant GIS poster expo every year. So last year we had 165 students submit GIS posters from their course projects, graduate projects, that sort of thing. Um, so we're really interested in, we just met with our provost office yesterday about doing, getting more analytics on institutional research. And at Tufts, we're really interested in discovering our, our international footprint. Tufts, we're the most international school in the United States. It's a big deal for us. I'm sure Harvard has very much the same interest like most schools. 
So what we did is we, we, we cataloged all these GIS posters and then we ingested all of these posters into Solver to get a sense of GIS uh, related research at Tufts. And so you can see right off the bat, it's a little fuzzy, but like, what is this, 36 uh, percent are undergraduates with 30, what is that? Yeah, uh, almost 60 percent graduate students. We can also see um, the schools they're coming from, whether it's Art and Sciences or the International School at Fletcher, right? The different departments that they're coming from, courses. This is the spatial coverage of their research projects. So we see where students are <coughs> conducting research at Tufts. And it's pretty interesting to take a look at because I, I teach there as well and I think I have a handle on things. But also I'm not aware of every bit of research going on and especially I'm getting older, my memory is also not what it used to be when I'm trying to remember student projects from five years ago and things like that. And not surprising, it tells tons on the East Coast, you know, all throughout Africa, South Asia, that sort of thing. Then we've developed different ways of visualizing because there's different ways of mapping this information. We're, particular, we're mapping people, so we're particularly interested in the spatial component um, of where GIS research Tufts is taking place. So these are different techniques of mapping uh, spatial phenomena, including text clouds and things like that. And we're also very local in the big urban planning program, big environmental studies. So we're very local as well as being very international. So you'll see Boston coming up and things like that. So what we might want to show here is, for instance, if we look at the undergraduates, undergraduate research. I get it? I got it. All right. so we'll turn it so things change quite a bit, and the spatial distribution of research changes quite a bit as well. So here's what undergraduates took, we're doing research. And there's a timeline, it's not showing up right now, but we can also search by timelines and things like that, which is uh, very interesting in looking at trends spatially of where people are doing projects. Um, is Syria increasing over time and things like that, which actually it does at times. We're, we're pretty tight in current events. Um, with our, with our students. So we can also then maybe qualify that by department. In this case, maybe international relations. Our uh, RI uh, program is quite a big program, very popular at Tufts. And we'll sort of see the qualifications of where those students, especially where they're mapping. We're also seeing thematically what they're mapping down here, whether it's things like community development, uh, natural resources, all this sort of work. So we're seeing not only spatially, but thematically of their research. So what I might do real quick, let me undo a couple of these queries at the top. And I know this isn't you know, data per se, GIS data, but this is about research. And this is kind of what we want to start bringing all this together, looking at our collections, combined with how people are using our sites, combined with our research, and building it to really kind of get a better handle and better strategic planning on, on how we move forward. So right now, this is everyone again. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to do non-US. So this is the meeting I had yesterday with our provost. There is an, an all international footprint of work. So I can go in here and I'll say, all right, show me everything that's outside of the United States. So these are all the projects that are outside of the United States. You see our graduate level increases uh, pretty dramatically. Uh, Fletcher School, this is where I'm a faculty member at the Fletcher School, this is our international school. That increases dramatically. And then I might want to even call it, especially I can see where it's going on, right, lots of South Asia, Africa. This, this looks very much like Tufts to me. Central Africa is always huge, the Horn of Africa. Um, and then I might even want to qualify it thematically. So I can say, let's look at different types of research. There's natural resources, maybe in this case, I'm really interested in humanitarian aid and relief outside the United States. That's sort of my specialty, what I do. Did I do that right? Yeah. And here we go. And this looks very, very much like it. You'll see Colombia is a big part. We do a lot of work in Colombia, uh, all through Central Africa, Northern Africa, and the Horn of Africa, the Near East, Afghanistan, Pakistan, tons of conflict, South Asia, parts of South Asia. So we're getting a handle on this. So we can actually even drill down to the individual projects here if we want, if we want to see them. So anyway, this is all I want to touch bases on a little bit about looking at analytics on research. 
uh, and how that can be used uh, as well with these sorts of tools, particularly spatially and you know, thematic research. We have a, I think a lot of schools have big interest in kind of bringing people together around geographic areas, and also how do we bring faculty together around certain types of application, might be public health, might be child, dental health, all that sort of thing. So, it's a nice. so the last one I'll show, and this one takes a while to digest. Um, this is pretty crazy looking. Uh, we're still working on this one. So this is uh, what we call the metadata inspector. And uh, for, for many of us, metadata is probably the single most costly part of having these big repositories. Metadata is really expensive to create and maintain, et cetera, especially to create. And many of us have metadata with a long history. We've been creating metadata for years and years and years. So it's a lot of history in the metadata. It's also a lot of errors in the metadata. So what this is designed is actually to find ways to find errors in the metadata, or if there's certain standards that need to be in place. This is what the European Union uses quite a bit in their Inspire project to make sure that everyone's adhering to certain standards in their metadata. But we can do it to find errors in metadata really quickly. So kind of a classic example here. Oh yeah, let me filter out. Once again, let me, um, so here's the institutions over here. These probably should be at the top. So we see Princeton has just a gobs of records. I'm gonna filter them out right now because they're kind of skewing everything. And I'm also going to filter out the UN FAO real quick so we can kind of get a better sense of the others. Go away. There we go. Okay. So one thing right off the bat is there's a lot of errors typically in content date. So what date does the data represent? This is really important if you're going to use the data particularly if you're using the boundary data or land cover or anything like that, the content date is really critical. So as we scroll down here, this is the con this is a content date widget. And then just as we go down, we see this, this content date right here, 0001-01, blah, blah, blah. That's an invalid content date. That's not a real content date. And there's 671 records that have that error. So 671 records have this particular content date error, which is a bad content date. So what we can do is take a look at those records. So now we're viewing those 671 errors with content date errors, but that specific content date, there's other ones. And we look at the institution, Berkeley right here. So Berkeley is the leader, 242. I'll have to tell Susan about that at Berkeley. MassGIS has 201. Which also, the, the error might be the way it's being ingested into solar, too. So it helps us kind of troubleshoot on the back end sometimes of our processes. Harvard, Mark. Bronze metal. Has 97. <laughs> Must be prior to uh, 2004. Yeah, it's too small. <laughs> um, but you'll see, this, so this is one quick way of just troubleshooting errors in metadata. And we also have new tools to batch edit all this as well. Um, that will be coming up. And you can actually see the individual metadata records. So you can actually get to those metadata records if you wanted to. So we could say, just look at Berkeley's if you wanted to, for instance. The other error, a really common error that comes up, are things like originators. Is that one I look at, Jonathan? Yeah. yeah. So this right here, this originator. I don't know if an originator called required. So what's what causes that? Anyone know what causes that? Park uh, catalog. Yeah, it's a software a lot of people who do geospatial metadata called our catalog puts in this default text called required blah blah blah. So if you don't if you don't put it in, you still have this remnants of text right there, which indicates it's very much an error in the originator. So we can also see who has those. So these are now institutions and or records that have that content date error and the required error. See, so we get to pick on here. When I demoed this in uh, Minnesota, I really picked on Princeton because they have such such vast collection, but they're so old that they, of course, also have probably the most errors in their metadata. Um, so we'll see here that it's largely, it's pretty evenly dispersed, Berkeley, Harvard, right? But then we can go down and actually get the records, take a look at them if you want. So this is the metadata inspector can be used in a lot of ways. It takes a while. We're still working out these dashboards. Anyone, anyone can use this and create all their own dashboards. So that's the nice thing. Customize it to your organization's need. Um, we'll probably, we would probably do stuff also more with timelines and some more visual things, I think, were part of this dashboard. And one of the things you can really do, I won't demo it, it's really easy to find errors in bounding boxes. 
So in the geospatial world and map world, bounty boxes are so critical because that's how we search data probably more than anything now, is it's, it's geographic footprint. Because we can zoom in and spatially search, because people are usually searching by a certain area. But what happens is the way people have done metadata, there's a lot of errors in bounty boxes. Sometimes they've used a template, they've got a bounty box from the wrong data set, um, or it's gotten ingested improperly. So there's hundreds and hundreds of errors in bounty boxes we found in OGP. I will go into the details now, we can later if we want. But it's also really useful for that, finding the most common errors and then seeing what data sets are there. So, I'll kind of finish up. On kind of the technical side of things, and we can answer and have much more discussions about this too if you want. So basically under the analytics, we're using solar as kind of key, which is great because solar is already a big part of the OGP um, architecture, and it's a big part of a lot of uh, geospatial architectures these days. Um, we're largely using this uh, project called Banana, which is forked from Cabana. So uh, Banana basically has a whole series of dashboard configurations you can work with. And then we're using Logstash. So when we get into the usage, uh, we're using logs stash to parse out logs, and log stash is great because it'll push it right into a solar schema. That's what log stash is going to do, um, both for solar logs and for Apache logs. And that's where we're looking at the usage and that sort of thing uh, to really kind of get a sense of that. So it's it's pretty pretty easy tools. They're all open source. Um, I don't know if log stash is technically open source. It's sort of freeware, if you will. Um, but nonetheless, Banana is. Um, it was developed by, what's his name, the guy who developed Solar. What's his name, Chris? Same as Smiley. Smiley, yeah. So, that's pretty much all we have. And so Chris and Jonathan did a ton of this work, so not, not so much me. And Carolyn did also a lot of the poster work. But, so now I'm just kind of open up for questions, or if you want to see stuff or whatever, I'm happy to have people dig in or whatever they want to do. What was the basis of the teaching and research dashboard? What was, do you have authentication logs, or how are you figuring out graduate versus undergraduate, or, you know, affiliation? Yeah, we basically uh, do really minor cataloging of the posters. Okay. So we have that on there. In fact, now what we do when students submit their posters, we have a new form where they publish it, that they, audit, they really quick enter that information using control vocabularies. So, so now it's all automated for this this fall. So, we just, and they also sign permission that says it's okay to put this on the web. Okay. Uh, so that's so that is it's really just really really uh, simple cataloging records. What we do next is actually ingest the posters themselves, the text. So I think we can mine a lot more information from that. Uh, but the, the impetus there is we really want to get a handle on our GIS research. Uh, where are people doing research? But also, when do we want to buy data sets? So we want to do more outreach, and also our, coming back to our, it's, it's kind of a, I feel it's a very much a proxy for faculty research. Students are often working on their faculty, not entirely, uh, but somewhat. And so we kind of we really use this as an example for our institutional research team on sort of techniques we can get out of really looking at institutional research and where it's going on and that sort of thing. So it's kind of a low hanging fruit. Uh, and students, we're gonna build a new search interface for this where students can go in and find previous projects in Cambodia or something like that, so they can see techniques, data sources, that sort of thing with old posters. So, so is this kind of a standalone app? You basically configure it by pointing it at your solar index and your location of your log files or something, and then it just does it? Or do you have to do more than that? To... How would you guys, I mean, there's some setup involved in customization, but it's pretty simple. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it depends a little bit on which, which one you're talking about. The, the log stash setup is a little more involved, um, but uh, but as far as the, the collections one, uh, that's that's pretty much you just point it at your solar instance. And it's the collections well. is just pointing directly at a solar instance and, and going with the schema that we already know exists for it. And if it were a different schema, you could configure for that schema that way. For uh, the usage with the, with the logs that required actually uh, going in and uh, parsing out the, the, the queries that were in the logs so that we could actually sort of identify which elements uh, of, uh, of the site were being used. For the collection, it's pretty easy. Then you just customize your interface on your warrants and logs. It's pretty easy. 
So have you packaged this up so far so that we, for example, could install it here and it would just work within a day? <laughs> yeah, we put it on GitHub, right? Yeah, the, the configuration is on GitHub. The Logstash stuff, like I said, you'll have to set up Logstash. That's a little more involved. But um, but for the uh, collections dashboard, yeah, that should be that should be trivial to set up. And something we also, especially with the long stash stuff, we like to work with other partners there and flushing that out. This is all sort of prototype stuff we're showing. We like to work with other people. There's a lot of people are really interested in this. We're, we're getting the sense right now. Right. And if there's some data that we would like to know that we're not quite getting at, I mean, this kind of just, we just kind of took information from the logs as it was um, without, <laughs> the logs weren't designed beforehand for this purpose. But now that we have this, I, you know this uh, usage in mind. We can do some uh, tweaking on the on how the logs output things and uh, do some other things there to get some better data. You can definitely uh, target certain pieces of information that maybe we weren't as interested in before, or that we are getting at because of uh, happenstance. But that in the future we can make a point of uh, keeping track of. So the logs you're talking about are the, the website search logs yeah. people search for. So so what about back to the, the student projects? How much of an effort is it to, to log all of those, you know, over the years and how much does it help your memory? Right? I mean you remember because that happens to me all the time. I, I think, oh well someone someone did something similar in that part of the world. And then I look through my files and I can't find it, and it's just huge search. But it, unlike the web logs are automatically logged, all the project students are doing with different, in different classes and for different you know, projects, I, I think that would be really difficult to systematically log all that. It's, How do you? Well, that was pretty that easy. We just, we set up, a, like I said, now we have a submission form, but it's just literally, they fill out a couple things that has control vocabulary. And then it's submit. searchable on here. Yeah. Um, and we know we also have all of these online, right? So we have like, about a thousand of them online. Um, and so the faculty, we have about 18 GIS classes at Tufts now. And the thing is, a lot of the faculty we reference these posters. And, and there's actually papers, we have every paper attached to it as well. And we reference these often when we're teaching, but you know, none of us can remember these projects. And because they're often a great example for students to go back to and look at methods and techniques. Um, so, you know, I can't remember that, oh, yeah, there was that project. Anastasia looked at Northern Kenya, the relationship between uh, conflict and political violence versus actually water resource, you know, conflict. You know, I can't remember all that stuff. I forget it. Um, so that's part of a lot of this too, as well as looking at trends in research and things like that. But it was pretty easy to catalog them actually. I mean, that was we had students do it. Our student staff we set up uh, vocabulary initially to have them do it. Uh, and then, then now we thought, let's automate that process and just, plus we need permission forms and stuff too. So we just do it right when they submit it, um, that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's really helpful for us. It, was there a, a backlog that you put in? Yeah, but we had, we had students do it. It did pretty quick. Yeah. You know, I'm sure there's errors in there, you know. But what we want to do now is, the next thing we're doing is we're just going to ingest all the public posters and papers directly. We want to compare that, what we get from that, which is unstructured data, right, for the most part. We want to compare that to what we get from doing some really just loose cataloging. So I think that's kind of one of the next steps we want to do and see, because we have a hunch that we can probably get just as good of, of results or even better. Because one of the other things students are always looking for in faculty is, oh, there was that project that actually used the zonal statistics tool. Well, which one was that? And it's the same thing with all of our tutorials. It's tough to find stuff like that. So I think we're just going to adjust them directly and see, kind of compare the results. So, yeah. and, and then as other universities might use this, would you allow them to tap into the, the project list that, that you have for Tufts? Yeah, yeah it's all, so these, are, these are all online. It's right all now. online already. Yeah, the posters are all online. We're creating a search tool for them because there, there's too many now. You can't, you know, there's over a thousand. You can't browse a thousand. Right. Yeah, and the faculty and you know our <coughs> provost office also likes to see this because we actually this gives us really good numbers. We're launching a new certificate program at Tufts. This gives us real numbers on the spikes in undergraduate work, what departments, how much they're using GIS, that sort of thing. So it's really good metrics for, for a lot of strategic planning, I think. 
Patrick. On the usage statistics, um, you showed um, layers that were, is that is that downloads or views or are you capturing both? Yeah, let me get rid of my, what query do I have going here? Uh, uh, sorry, I got the wrong right answer. So we're in, where's that at the top? This is no below. So we're capturing downloads, we're capturing uh, metadata views, and um, there's also the ability to capture things like previewing a layer or identifying an attribute of a layer, things like that. Uh, <coughs> so you're separating downloads by raster right there. Uh, not so we're not doing that right now. Right. But we probably could. Right. That, that that's sure. where the the uh, ability to sort of combine something like data holdings with usage would, would start to, to get into some of those insights. <coughs> uh, but but yeah, so based based on the type of query that goes into those different uh, requests, we can we can tell the difference between a download versus the metadata versus uh, preview, etc. And would this be able to capture something like um, a correl correlation of downloads? Like if two downloads or two layers are downloaded at the same time, or those relationships? That's interesting. Yeah, I'm sure. What do you um, What do you think, Chris? We probably could, right? I'm sure I mean, the information is there. I mean, mine it. Yeah, I I don't know if you can capture from what we're currently outputting, but you, you would have to go back and do some. Calculation probably on like the timestamps to, to get some point like done, but um, you know, going forward, if that's something that we're interested in, we could say, you know, put some something that <laughs> some sort of marker in the, yeah. in the logs that made that apparent. Well, you so, think so, about you know using Amazon or something, right? And I, I purchase something or I'm viewing something, and they say, oh, this person also viewed X, Y, and Z, and I actually use that those functions quite a bit because when you're starting to look through. Just millions of records is a challenge, you know. Right. Sometimes I don't want what they, you know. That's interesting to think about in the context of a research environment where scholars might not always want everybody to know that they're working on a particular thing while they're working on it because it's, you know, it's original and they're hoping to publish a paper on it. But that's rather interesting. So um, we never capture a person. We don't. No, try, no, but, that's one thing we we're very much traditional in that way from a library perspective. We're seeing what people are searching for, not yeah, that person. It's anonymized, but yeah, yeah. but you are saying that you know uh, somebody was very interested in this obscure part of you know Ethiopia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, <coughs> it's, anyway, not, it's not really it's anonymized. Have. You but can, um, yeah. uh, so so. So every action is um, is, is logged, um, probably not like panning and zooming. No, it is. It is? Okay. Yeah, because each time um, you do that, you generate a new search. Right, okay. And so um, are those actions all, um, how granular is information about where that's coming from? So is it by school, by department? Do you have that kind of information, or is it just that information isn't even tracked? It's totally anonymous. Yeah, that's not tracked. We, you know, we can get down to, you know, country of origin and stuff like that, but that's about all we can. Origin of the IP coming in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But we don't do anything about tracking departments or anything like that. Yeah. That's that's not really something we would probably have to do. Yeah. So, so under the covers is the log stash stuff. Is that really basically parsing the logs and building a solar index that represents those logs and then this visualizations and everything is driven off a solar index? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly so right. so you could, I mean, there's a lot of configuration and parsing and changes, but you could map this to another system, a totally different non-OGP system by kind of following the cookbook of what you did, but doing it a little bit differently for your own logs. And yeah, we had more time, so we've done a lot. So what we're also doing is analytics. So Trunk is our uh, learning management system at Tufts. That's what we use. It's customized to Kai. So what we do is we work with our LMS team to basically parse out all the logs from the LMS. So we can actually see all the different tools that people are using in our LMS. We can also see if they're using, what, if, how many PDFs are there, all the sort of content, see, really get a sense of 
of what's being well, That's what I was thinking of the This is on top of our DRS. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and quite frankly, there's yeah. probably more interested in tops than that than there is in, even, even in the geospatial stuff, right? Yeah. Um, the other thing we're doing is we're going in and doing analytics for departments and looking at their whole, we'll ingest their entire department website. And what we do with that is we say, okay, do we do visualization analytics? And here's what's really coming out of your site. We all think we know what's coming out of our site, but by doing that sort of analytics, we really get to tease out what's in, what's really coming out, and what are the themes of research and threads, and we're doing it with a lot of our new blogs too, provide a new way to start interacting with blogs, you know, so that I can actually go and look at all the blogs that might be related to Syria, for instance, or something like that, coming out of our World Peace Foundation, uh, things like that. So that's something else. There's a lot of interest in that in these, in these applications. With both structured and unstructured data. What's the code all written in that does all of the log parsing and everything? Is it Java? Is it Ruby? Is it uh, I don't know. Python? It's kind of its own thing. It's got a little bit of a Ruby flavor, but it's. What would you say, Chris? Yeah, I think uh, I think log stash is, is Java. Yeah. Well, that's the, the back end. Right. right. The back end. Yeah. The kind of the there's a, uh, kind of a language. Uh, that Logstash has on its own to uh, describe what the, how the log is structured. Um, but yeah, it's Java based. Um, the, the dashboard stuff is is pretty much all JavaScript. It's all front end. Uh, so it's Angular and D3. Which is nice. So pretty easy to work with for us. I think that's kind of, yeah. The key is in structured or unstructured data, that sort of thing. I don't know if you guys see many applications for that sort of stuff. I think also far beyond the geospatial is where we're getting a lot of interest. That's cool. And so we'd like to work more even with the OGP community on this. Is kind of a new plan to really kind of roll this out. So everyone seems to want to answer these same questions. Um, but it's also neat to be able to go in and look at a collection to see what you really have without running individual searches and looking at individual layers, you know, that sort of thing. And we're, going to, we're going to improve the mapping quite a bit too, so that's the thing we're going to focus on a lot. Um, From the collections view, can you then just, you know, you can pass it pretty quickly on that. It's kind of nice. Yeah. Um, can you then just, you, I saw the layer list there, but can you then just launch a search? Like bring up that actual search, you know, in OGP? In theory, you could. We don't, we don't have that set up. But yeah, you just do. You just walk. You just uh, well, put it together. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Just nice. just feed it into the URL. Yeah. So does the layer list that have does that have export capability? Or uh, with this layer list, yeah, you can export this yeah. as a table of some kind. That would be really useful for the metadata cleanup. Yeah. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. Totally. Your own little list of these are the list of layers I need to go back to. These are their file names, etc. Yeah. Did you write your own metadata cleanup tools, or or did you base base them on a, on a sort of a set of existing XML libraries for comparing XML documents, or or, or both? Or, um, so the tools that we have are. Um, they share a lot of code in common with uh, Geo Network. Yeah. Yeah. So if anything else. Yeah. yeah. So the new um, we just built a new metadata toolkit, which is not quite ready for prime time yet. On Geo Network. Yeah, yeah. It's it's based on Geo Network's code base, but it's a uh, just a basic simple website for wrapping metadata on. Right. Um, but that's basically uses their code base. But that combined with what we're rolling out on the part of the harvester as well that has. Pretty sophisticated batch metadata editing capabilities. So you use batch edit thousands of records from fast to, or especially things like where um, a lot of the you know the language, the usage language. Well, all of our universities have our own legalese, and sometimes that might change. So you can just update that with every metadata record really easily, or maybe the originators or something like that. You know that sort of thing, or where we find these errors. You know. Tag cloud generation is that coming courtesy of Banana or Havana or yeah yeah D three D three more specifically yeah. yeah once again just a pretty simple way 
I'm just kind of teasing out, visualizing what's there. Yeah, yeah. Some people sure. really respond well to that, you know, some don't. Yeah. Sure beats AW stats. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's interesting to see the collections too. You know, you get to, you really get a sense of different people's, people's different collections. You know, something like the University of Minnesota, there's is pretty heavy in Minnesota, but then within Minnesota to them, there's quite a bit of variation within Minnesota itself, right, where their collections are and things like that. So I think it's interesting to see the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the, the throughput of your site for data from Harvard, for example. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. And we'd be very interested to see the yeah. throughput from your guys' yeah. side. Of, of kind of like that aggregate, yeah. Yeah, and right now it's tricky because with, with the log stats, we're the only one really running it, right? That's why we do want everyone running. We can kind of agree on all the schemas of logs. Right. Then it'll make that even so much better because then we can really share that out and federate that. You just federate those solar cores, basically. Yeah. Absolutely. Every every instance would have its federated log core. That'd be cool. Yeah. That's, that's something we're really interested in doing, I think. And, it, and it's pretty low overhead. It takes a little bit of work, but it's not that hard. We've already kind of done heavy lifting, I think. I think you've got some sites that have metadata, but their data isn't online. Yeah. That might be problematic. And that's good. Yeah, but some of people are searching for them. Right? I mean, you know, a lot of, I know a lot of people are getting our data from their site, from other sites. You know, that. That's okay. Yes. And, and even if we don't have download statistics, maybe we then look at those institutions that are metadata reviewing statistics if that the link is in the metadata. It's just it's nice to take a look and see. And I know you guys were interested in that, right? So I think a lot of people are getting that historic German GIS data sets from at least at least one person was completely obsessed with data because yeah. we can we can drill down to actually see like the day that, that person was you know, really, really after the historic German stuff. Each of the Harvard solar cores. Yeah, yeah, so totally do that. Let's go back to the issue. All right. Uh, and you can go to one and then I can Okay. And then, that, then you're looking at Harvard solar cores. Okay. So this is just Harvard solar cores. This is queries from the HGL front end to our solar cores. Okay, so should I yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, so so um, as part of um, using Logstash, one of the things that came out of it was that we could tell part OGP one and OGP two queries to our solar. Those are different versions of OpenGL portal. Harvard's running OGP one. We're running OGP two. So because we were able to tell the difference, we were actually able to uh, learn something about uh, what was what was being searched from Harvard versus what was being searched from Tufts. And so we've now filtered based on what was being searched from Harvard. Um, so the, the, the view of the map uh, where the searches are changes, the top word search queries change. Um, Patrick was referring to this person who was really interested in World War II Belgium. Um, that comes up a bit. That, yeah, and the historic Germany yeah, yeah. stuff, which does come up but comes up uh, more than once. So if you were going to filter to uh, just HGIs, that's the play book. Yeah, then you've got lots of LA. Uh, the room is taken by the Thanks. You gotta do that. Yes. Yeah.